What's good, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast. I'm Andrew Renee, joined as always by Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. And Miss Christine Steimer. Oh, hello. Hey. Oh, I just, I pulled a break. Wait. I make such unpleasant noises. I'm so sorry about that. I think about that every week. Are you sorry? I don't think you're sorry. I think you do this intentionally. No, it's like, I'm I'm not, I don't regret the grossness of the of the audible things that come out of my mouth but i but i i feel bad for those i subject it to it's like i'm not going to stop but i'm sorry that it's such a gross noise yes <laughs> well it's not, it's not a bad noise it's not pleasant also, now i'm curious like so everybody who's listening if i sound way better it's because i have a new shore microphone which is not sponsored it sounds totally sponsored um if they but... wanted to sponsor us i would gladly take their money because we have spent a lot of money with them <laughs> I would also take their money, but point being that I'm getting paranoid now because I like the children have just returned from me on yonder wherever the they come. The children come. have returned. <laughs> to live across the street and always make a lot of noise, so I usually close my windows when then and become like a sweaty mess. But I've left my windows open, hoping that this sure microphone saves me from the Los Angeles heat. So this- if you do hear something, I apologize. <laughs> There's only one way to find out. I'll I'll be extra vigilant when I'm editing the show this week and, and see uh, what I can hear. But yes, we have upgraded microphones for both Brittany and Steimer. And that, of course, is in large part due to some of our amazing sponsors that we have on the show and also to our fantastic Patreon community. Uh, you guys supporting us month after month has allowed us to upgrade some of our equipment. And hopefully one day we'll have enough money to buy new cameras. Still working on that. Uh, I mostly just need to decide how much money I want to spend because cameras are expensive. Um, yes, they but are. Uh, yes, they are. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt a Steimer song. Oh no, that was it. Was just like a, a quip song to like add on to the end of what you were saying. Aww. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that joint venture. If this is your first time joining us on the show, this of course is the What's Good Game podcast, your source for video game commentary analysis and funny stuff. We are here every week bringing you the news with, you know, our opinions. What's a better way to say it? Uh, Oh, our our hot takes. Hot takes. I like the hot takes. You know, it's funny. bring you the news when there is news. Yes. Well, there is not really very much news today, but before we get to that, um, we do have a couple pieces of of housekeeping and announcements to get to. Uh, First, somebody in the YouTube comments did mention that they are a brand new listener. Welcome. Of course, if you guys are listening to the show on podcast services, including the new Google Podcast app, where Brittany assured me we are publishing, you can also watch us at youtube.com slash what's good games. If you hit that subscribe button, we would greatly appreciate it. And if you hit the little bell, it'll let you know every time we upload a new piece of video content. Of course, on podcasts, you might want to hit that subscribe button too. We had a little snafu recently with Apple where if you weren't subscribed to the podcast, it wasn't updating our our episodes and now we double checked and made sure it wasn't nothing on our end. It was 100% on Apple's end. Is that correct, Brent? That is tisk, correct. Tisk. It was a bug that was affecting a lot of people and for a few weeks, I think, actually. And yeah, it took 24 hours for the episode to populate to non-subscribers. So hit that button. Smash it, That's whatever weird. cool kids say yeah. these days. Yeah. I like to say ding the bell. Oh, ding the bell. Ding, I mean, ding, I just ding, literally ding. made that up, but it feels like a thing that should happen. Ding, ding the it. bell. Because there are now ding. real consequences to not subscribing. You could get the show late. No one wants that. You want to be in the know. Oh. Listening to it right away a Friday morning. Speaking of which, if you're listening to this on Friday morning, that means that we are at RTX Austin. That's right. All weekend long, we are going to be hanging out in sweaty, hot Austin, (laughs) Texas uh, at RTX. If you guys are in the Texas area or can maybe make a spontaneous trip, don't forget you can still get tickets at RTXAustin.com. If you guys are going to be tweeting to us, if you want to use that hashtag RTXAustin, that would be fantastic. We finally have our meetup details. If you guys have not seen them on the Facebook page, of course, facebook.com slash what's good games, twitter.com slash what's good underscore games or where you can get all of our latest announcements. The what's good games, Andrew Renee birthday, happy hour meetup or WGG for short. 
Is it's a problem. <laughs> We're going to have a yeah, It's happening it. from it's 5 right. to 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, that's Friday, August 3rd at Handlebar. And they have assured me via their website that there is absolutely no mustache art anywhere. I think that they're being facetious. <laughs> I Wait, think that there's it? probably mustaches they somewhere. Like, there, there are, are no mustaches. mustaches. <laughs> there's got to be a mustache in there somewhere, whether it be on someone's person or on the walls. Yes, exactly. But we're going to go there and have a good time and take a bunch of silly photos and have a couple drinks. Uh, so if you are 21 and over, you can come and join us starting at 5 p.m. at Handlebar again in Austin on West 6th Street down by the convention center where RTX Austin is happening. If you are under 21, you still want to hang out. Don't worry. We've got a panel. Britt, tell the kids all about it. Oh my goodness, ladies and gentlemen. So this panel is going to be all about podcasting. I don't know what that accent's all about. I apologize. It's almost <laughs> Southern. Texas? <laughs> no, I don't even, I didn't even put two and two together. It's just oh. this happens. I don't know. I think I'm like, I don't know what's going on in my life. You're stronger um, my kind of special. Yeah. Thank you, baby. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to be talking about podcasting. You know, what makes a good podcast? What lessons have we learned along the way? How you should consider hosting options and monetization and how to promote it and all those wonderful good things that we have spent the last year plus learning and we can now bestow our knowledge upon you like you don't buy it. don't put a heavier mic on a boom arm that can't su support it because it yeah. might just fall off it happened these are the happened. kinds of things that we're going to be talking about on the panel. So if you guys have ever wanted to ask us questions about podcasting and boy, oh boy, there's a lot of you out there that have messaged us over the months since we have launched about this, please come at the panel. Um, I don't believe we're going to be able to record this. Ooh. I have to double check with RTX. So apologies if you miss it. Good news is, is we could do this panel again. Maybe we could do it at PAX sometime. Or maybe we could do it, you know, uh, as a secret segment. Who knows? Speaking of Who which. No, knows? Possibilities are endless. Right Thank you for your patience, um, all of our lovely secret segment patrons. Uh, because of some travel in the month of July, the secret segment published a little bit late as did the Patreon exclusive video. You can get all of the details, of course, at patreon.com slash what's good games. And lastly, we have one more thing we're doing at RTX. Brittany, what are we doing Sunday morning at the crack of dawn? Oh, we're going to be wide awake. <laughs> we're bright eyed and bushy tailed. And we're going to be sad. <laughs> the accent came out again. We're doing autographs from, is it 9.30 to 11? Yes. I believe it is. Yeah, 9.30 to 11. Ballroom A, booth five. I've said it, I said it last week. If we have drinks with us, they're probably mimosas. Don't I anything. just realized you saying that we're doing autographs made me realize I didn't sign any of the postcards that I sent out. Like they don't know who it's from. Like I just put really. Riddles. I was like, hey, thanks so much. Like here's a fun riddle. Didn't put my name on it. I just realized. Whoops. So, oh, that's so funny. if you were a patron and you got a riddle, <laughs> it's from me. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize. I was very scatterbrained when I did those. Yeah. We had someone in our Facebook group, that's facebook.com slash groups slash what's good games. It's the official closed off fan page where it's, you know, you have to prove that you know what we are, what we do in order to get in because, you know, we're a tight knit community. Anyway, we had someone ask, what the hell do I bring for them to sign on this autograph mm -hmm. session? And I good said, question. dude, we can sign a badge. We will sign a literal piece of trash. We don't care. We're not, I mean, you it's, know. it's not like going to get us, listen, I'm just saying as long as it's not going to get us sick and as long as yeah. it's not going to get you sick and as long as it's not a body part. If it was a Garbador, that'd be cool. We well, that would be cool. Well, we have a bunch of extra postcards just kind of hanging around. We hanging do. Around. We could bring them. I could bring some, and we could sign those. You know, yeah, see yeah. if we had actually, you know, been planning like we should have, and in true what's good games fashion, uh, we could have printed something unique and special to you bring know what to would RTX be unique Austin. And special. Which is what we should we have done. The same postcard with RTX written in Sharpie. That's special. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe there's still time. I can head to Kinko's. I could print out something. I'll think about it. I'll see what I can do. Don't you worry, ladies and gentlemen don't out sign there. Yourself up for that. It's your birthday. You've got things. Yeah, you it's don't. my just, birthday. Just enjoy your life. <laughs> Thanks, Timer. Enjoy your life. <laughs> Seriously, the rapidly approaching burnout. Um, all right. Speaking of uh, burnout, no, that's a bad segue. It's a terrible segue. Did not work at Unless all. Unless you're talking about Burnout Paradise. Remastered? I have that sitting yeah. on the shelf over here. Haven't played it yet. <laughs> Haven't installed on the PS4. Haven't been home. I've been bringing my Switch with me everywhere because that thing's just so dang portable. 
Um, before we get on to the news, I just want to remind you guys, if you missed any of these, all the details, we will be, uh, will be on our website, whatsgoodgames.com, and of course, all of our social channels. And of course, don't ever hesitate to reach out to us if you're like, but where is the meetup on Friday? And I'll be like, it's the place that doesn't have mustaches. Um, okay. <laughs> One of the two. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is where I'm going to tell you that this week's news is brought to you by Vincero. You know, I almost said that wrong. I had to actually watch a video of Pavarotti singing Vincero because I kept saying Vincero and John was like, um, excuse me. No, in Italian, C and E is a che. I know. So I, I, lear I learned. I watched a YouTube video and I learned it. And now I'm going to tell you guys all about them because they're a really cool company. So if you guys have never heard of Vincero... Their mission is to create compelling luxury timepieces. Yes, watches with impeccable craftsmanship to inspire as many people as possible to elevate their game and lift their legacy. Their goal is to inspire people, of course, to learn that luxury is a process. It's not about specs. No, no, ladies and gentlemen. It's not about price and it's not about a marketing term to be thrown around. It's about attention to detail. I, of course, am wearing my Vincera ladies watch right now. Um, so what's really cool about this company, you guys, is that they use a step-by-step -step process to craft these watches. And they ha have more than just watches, too. They've got men's sunglasses. They've got men's bracelets. And they've got a bunch of different styles, colors, bands, pretty much anything that you could possibly want. And they are, look super sleek. So they believe that everybody deserves the best. And they were tired of the cookie cutter designs that we see because let's be honest there are a bazillion types of watches out there and a lot of them are mass-produced minimalist watches that of course have flooded the market so they wanted to offer a watch that was able to stand out and get noticed to set you apart rather than to conform to simple design at an all accessible price so i will have to point out that my one of my favorite things about this company is that finchero literally means i will win which is, should be like my personal Ooh. motto because that's I mean, kind of how I feel, I feel like, about yeah, life. You should get that tattooed on you somewhere. I know, right? Go ahead, girl. I'm not even Italian at all. Would it be really weird if I just got something in Italian tattooed on me? Probably. No, I think it's totally fine. It's a beautiful language. Vincero. That's true. It is. Thanks, Timer. I appreciate that. Um, if you guys want to learn more about what kinds of amazing handcrafted pieces Vincero has at their website, you guys can head on over to vincerowatches.com slash WGG and enter the promo code What's Good to get 15% off your entire order. That's Vincero Watches, so V-I-N-C-E-R-O, watches.com slash WGG. Enter that promo code What's Good to get 15% off your entire order order and i will um i'll post a picture of my watch since it's a little bit hard to see with the reflection coming from the lights here's you guys can take a look at it i got the the rose gold with the gray leather band and i got a black leather band that you can swap out because you can swap out the bands which is kind of cool um and again one more time vincerawatches.com slash wgg promo code what's good thank you so much for sponsoring this episode of what's good games all right on to the news it's all about Nintendo Switch this week. Well, also PlayStation 4. So, because they both announced their sales numbers, ironically, at the same time. I don't think they intended to do that, but we got a news story this week announcing that Nintendo Switch has sold just under 20 million units, while the PlayStation 4 announced that they have hit over 80 million units sold. So, let's start with Nintendo. This is a pretty great number. I believe that this was their target for all of 2018, right, was to hit 20 million. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to sell another 20 million through 2019, I think March 2019. So, yeah. So they have less than a year to sell an additional 20 million. Go, go, go. Is that yeah. what you're saying? <laughs> so, like, they want to sell it. So they're still, still predicting that they'll sell another additional 20 million from April into March 2019. That's what I was trying to say. From no, but that's, I mean, that's a lot. That'd be 40 million Switches, right? Like, yeah. that's like doubling yeah. the amount of Switches that they have. Do they really think Smash is going to sell that many Switches? Yeah. I mean, I think Smash is yes. going to do well. I think Pokemon Let's Go is going to do really well. I think, yeah, I think Switch is just going to go, not to mention the hardcore Breath of the Wild disc Pokemon game. I just totally made that up. It's probably not happening, <laughs> but I got to get my hype going. Fine. That's been announced that it's yeah, coming that out. Yeah, invisible hype train. Late 20. Hey, listen. It, is it going to happen the way I want it to? Probably not. But I can hope and I can dream right now because I have no definitive proof either way. So right now I'm living in my fantasy bubble. 
Okay. Well, I want, I'm glad that you brought goal. up the games because along with this announcement, they also released some sales numbers for their top selling games. And I have the top five selling Nintendo Switch games. Number one, no surprise, Super Mario Odyssey. Mario is their number one seller most of the time. 11.17 million units. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, number two. Very close with 10.35 million units. And then The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild coming in third place with 9.3 million units. Splatoon 2 in fourth place with 6.76 million units. And 1-2 Switch in fifth place with 2.45 million units. These numbers, of course, being pulled from IGN.com. I think that this is really fascinating because... I would have assumed that Zelda would have sold more since it kind of had like a little window of exclusivity where no other games were really available until Mario Kart 8 came out. And then it was like a whole like four months until Odyssey. Well, maybe even five months before Odyssey came out. And so those two games really kind of had like a lot of room. Obviously, there, there were some smaller titles that came out. There was some indie titles that came out as well. But um, did these numbers surprise you at all or are they kind of right where you th thought they would be? No, I think Mario is always going to trump Zelda. Like, that's not even close. Like, yeah. they're, I mean, it is close. <laughs> they're, they're a couple of million units off. But I'm not surprised that Odyssey overtook it, I guess is what I'm saying. And it's not um, surprising that the Switch sales are going to just skyrocket when a new Mario game comes out. I think we've talked about this probably last year, but... Zelda definitely has a hardcore following, you know, that will buy any console specifically for Zelda. But Mario is definitely every freaking where. Every, Mario is, like, probably the most for recognizable. for everyone. Yeah. 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 So that's not surprising to me. Um, I think it's really cool. I saw this tweet from Go Nintendo, and this is kind of a he kind of breaks it down in an interesting he or she I'm not sure, but this is what they said. Here's yet another look at how well the Switch is doing. After approximately 16 months, PS4 has sold 20.2 million units worldwide. As for Switch, the system has sold 19.6 million units in approximately 15 months. Now the PS4 did this with two holiday seasons, while the Switch has only gone through one. So I keep forgetting how new that baby switch is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marsha, last year. I've been through one one holiday. Yeah, and so it's it's interesting to see people speculate. You know, will the switch sell as much as the PS4 ever had? Who knows? I mean, I don't know. Good. It could. I mean, if you think the thing with the switch, which is interesting, is I feel like it's not weird to have multiple switches in a house. You know, I think mm. it's a portable system, right? So you Nintendo's even said their goal is to have a Switch in everybody's hand, which, of course, is every business's goal to have their product in every household and every person that lives there. That's an expensive thing. Right, but I feel like, you know, it takes place, it's taken place to the 3DS. It's now, like, also a console, and it's something that I think families can really take with them and they travel and multiple people can all gather around their little couch or on the fireplace while they're watching like the news and playing on their switches. Whereas I feel like it seems a little more out of place if everyone has a PS4 in their house, which I mean, I know I have like two or three in my house. I think Andrea has a couple as well. Dude, I but have I like think five. That's not, that's not even norm. funny. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it, it, it definitely takes more to like to have the Xbox, multiple Xboxes or multiple Playstations. Whereas you're right, like the Switch is basically, I mean, a giant Game Boy but, or a giant DDS, but um, did I just call it a DDS? You did. I think I stuttered. That's what happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, anyways, uh, so yeah, like I never this this switch of mine has never been hooked up to a television. Never? Not not once. Never. So like yeah. you can just treat it entirely like a portable device, which I do. But I do think it's probably. I don't know if it's realistic to be like we want a switch for everyone because it is an expensive device. <laughs> so like. This is not a a thing that you can just will into existence in your life. You have to budget for it. Sure. I think it's definitely more doable, like I was saying. Like, you know. Also, um, I think it's interesting that it's already outsold the Wii U, which we've talked about, and the GameCube. The GameCube, I think, it's peaked at like 22. Thank fucking God. Otherwise, yeah. that would be real I mean, sad. the GameCube sold 22 million, and I think last we heard Nintendo had sold like, what, 20 million, but that was of just... That was of a few months ago, December or something. So I think it's going to outsell it. Anyway, cool stuff. I'm glad it outsold the two worst consoles Nintendo has ever put out. <sighs> listen, I like the GameCube. <laughs> hey, listen, like, I, mean worse the GameCube. Of, I mean worse in terms of performance, not in terms of the content that they had on right now. It's okay. We, we'll let you guys rage in the, in the comments about what is the worst Nintendo console of all time. Um, but... The crazy part is while they still are doing great, they have a long way to go to catch up to where PlayStation is. 
Uh, obviously, they released much later in the generation. We have argued on this show before that are they even in the same generation? I would say that there's a case to be made that no, that they're not because they're offering two different experiences. And the overlap of games that you can get on both systems is very small, as evidenced by the top 10 selling games on the Nintendo Switch, which are all Nintendo games with the one exception of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Yes, yeah, so. They're all Nintendo first-party games. So that's uh, indicative of kind of where Nintendo's priorities are. They're clearly like, hey, we're in a race against ourselves at this point. We're not trying to compete. I think the yeah, one thing that could really help elevate them is obviously the release of the new Pokemon. I'm not talking about Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu. Oh. I'm talking about what's coming in 2019. And, of course, Smash in December. And then I think, I do think Fortnite is going to help them sell units. Um, I saw a Nintendo Switch ad while I was watching some sports a couple days ago, and the first game in the Nintendo Switch ad was Fortnite, and then it was Mario, and then it was ARMS, you know? Like, so their pri their first party games took a backseat to Fortnite being out in front, which I thought was very interesting. <laughs> Andrea, can you imagine if they did a pinata version of of like the switch like they branded it like it had a little pinata on the back and it had the purple oh my god icon. that would be so genius i don't think nintendo would ever so do good. it but like <laughs> but it was, are you kidding like it would sell like gangbusters it like, would but i be like, i, I want know, that man epic they did that at christmas mm, maybe I, mean, I don't know if they will but they should for money reasons totally i i just i've heard a lot of rumblings about epic and their licensing deals that they're working on. I don't know if you guys saw that wacky Todd McFarlane video that came out. You know, the, the toy yeah. maker, McFarlane Toys. Oh, yeah. About how he, oh, like, wait, did yeah, this. Yeah, I saw about the, yeah, they're making figurines. Yeah, like how he was doing all these weird Fortnite dances, being looked, but he wouldn't come out and say that he was making Fortnite toys. And I'm like, why don't, why don't you just say it? Otherwise, why are you doing this video? It was funny. Yeah. Um, Todd's a great guy, though. I've gotten to work with him on the Assassin's Creed franchise before. Um, I just thought it was so weird seeing this guy do all these Fortnite dances. Um, but yeah, that would be a, a great plan. And pretty soon there will be a llama somewhere on set. Oh so my God, if yeah. you guys are following me on, on my Instagram um, or on Twitter, you might have seen me post photos last weekend of a Fortnite llama pinata, like a full size pinata <laughs> that, um, my friend who got married, who works for Epic, had these custom llamas from the Fortnite Party Royale that he brought to his wedding. And I was like, can I take one of those home? Because they let people steal them from the Party Royale. Like Epic kind of like sanctioned people taking, like cutting the llamas down and taking them home. And so I was Wait, like, what? I could have climbed a tree and got yeah. a llama? Yep. I, Epic instructed security neck, but, you know. to allow people to take the llamas home from the party royale. And so people did. Um, and so I took one of the llamas down and was like, can I take this home with me? Because I didn't want to obviously steal something from his wedding. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's very good. That's did, but like you didn't want yeah. to be that person. And he was like, please, please take it. And I was like, OK, I'm doing it. <laughs> but then I got it back to the hotel and I was like, this is really big. I can't put this in my luggage. What am I going to do? Did you carry it on the plane? No, I didn't because I, I didn't think that they would let me put it in the overhead bin because, you know, you can't put animals in the overhead bin, obviously. <laughs> it's not alive. I know. I know. It was a joke. Summer. No, just the, the image of you like walking on the plane, walking down the aisle. With I, wish, big old yeah. fucking I probably would have gotten accosted. I bet you somebody in the airport would have punched me in the face, stolen and ran. Um, <laughs> that also might be true. But yeah, we were. Like, yeah, wasn't we were, it too big to even fit in the overhead bin? Yes, it was. It was large, and I didn't want to like crush it, so we took it to FedEx, and they created a custom box for us because it's so weirdly <laughs> shaped. Um, nice. And it should be arriving any day now. Hopefully, I was really nervous about putting it in the mail, but here we are. Yeah, because you never know. Just like kick that stuff around, oh, right? Oh god, that's hilarious. It like never shows up, and I find out later that someone at that FedEx office like totally stole that. Um, but they're cool. They're custom, like, one-of-a-kind llamas because um, they told me a really cool story about how they helped a struggling pinata maker in downtown L L.A. save her business by giving her this giant custom order. 
And that if she hadn't what? gotten this order from Epic for these cool llamas, that her business might have closed. But they came oh, in and said, you do that. great work and we want to help you save your business. So make all these pinatas for us. That's cool. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. I, uh, so putting that money to, to good use, helping small business owners. Yeah. A uh, friend of the show, uh, Stephanie, inquired about this llama. And I said, it's an insurance policy for our company because... <laughs> If something goes wrong, we can probably sell that llama for a cool ten grand at some point in our life, you know. And uh, it's cool. Who knows? We have yeah. to like pry it out of Andrea's cold dead hands first, I think. <laughs> it's if it's in the studio, it's it's it's, it's ours. It's so shiny. Like, like the like, the the I paper the paper they use the on it is so for pretty. For the good of the business. <laughs> for the good of the business. Property of the West Good Games if it's in the studio. Surprise. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. There's a lot of my personal <laughs> toys in here, Miss Brittany Brom. I was wondering how Brittany Brom Brocker acquired all of your personal assets. Well, that lasted for all three seconds, ladies and gentlemen. Absorb. It's like a marriage. You just shrunk. It's all <laughs> ours. I love that you. I love that you attempted it, though. What were we talking about? We were talking about PlayStation Four numbers. That's right. Sold a bunch of stuff. I've got a little write-up here over on um, PCMag.com. They write, the best-selling game console of all time is the PlayStation 2 with 155 million units sold over its lifetime. And it seems very unlikely that total will ever be beaten. However, this week, both Sony and Nintendo have a reason to be happy as their current-gen consoles are selling extremely well. Sony, who has IGN reports, just released its Q1 FY 2018 financial year, fiscal year, uh, figures, revealing another 3.2 million PS4 consoles have been sold between April and June. That takes the total lifetime sales up to 82.2 million. In comparison, the PS3 total lifetime sales topped out at 83.8 million, meaning the PS4 is easily going to surpass it. The next target after that is the original PlayStation, which managed 102.49 million units. Wow. Ooh. This is wild that it's been that many. But, I mean, their first-party lineup is continuing to dominate, and Spider-Man's not out yet. Spider uh, the yeah. Last of Us Part Two isn't out. We got Days Gone. And we got Death Stranding, which was coming, you Let's know, in, not... like, 2022. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know that Days Gone is going to sell any consoles, but, like, yeah. the people who own PlayStations will be excited about it. That's true. Spider-Man will be that console seller for sure. What's what's that, Brit? And, and T-Lude. I don't, I don't... I'm trying to... Oh, She's I, trying to oh. web. She's trying to. Well, I was trying to web, but before that, I was pointed at me about people who are really excited about Days Gone. That's me. Ah, yes. Yeah. But you already own multiple PlayStation Fours. I do. You're welcome, Sony. Thanks. I just have the one. Uh, you're you're helping you're helping John out. And full full disclaimer, since I've been told I don't disclaim it enough, in case you guys have somehow missed it, um, my husband works for PlayStation. That's a thing. Goodness. Disclosure. Oh my God. Wait. Shut it down. Does. We're done. This podcast is over. Shut it down. It's get done. All this the studio. Um, yeah, so this is great. Congratulations, you guys are doing well. It appears that Xbox is no longer interested in ever talking about its sales numbers. So how well the Xbox One, the S, and the X are doing, I don't think we'll ever know. I don't think that they're ever going to release their numbers at this point. I think they're like, we don't need to. I mean, we don't need to talk about they it. Can't. I mean, they can. They obviously have the ability to do so. But I think anything that's not on par with Sony would just make them look not great. So like, there's no real reason to just like, no, it's fine. We're fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. Crackdown will come eventually. Maybe. Oh. <laughs> oh. I really want Crackdown. I'm very upset. You and millions of other Crackdown fans. I, I just, I think for me, I just have stopped thinking about it because I'm just tired of the stories of it. Like just always being delayed. So I'm like, okay, well, it's been delayed, what, three times now? To, for me, yeah. it's no longer... Honestly, too many. I'm pretty worried. Yeah, it's no longer a game yeah. I can think about. So I'm kind of just like, well, that game was a thing that happened once, and maybe it will come out, and maybe it won't. The Half-Life thing, man. I'm telling you. Come on, Xbox. Well, I think it's way farther along than we ever got with Half-Life. Half-Life 3 was just, like, never even a thing. People just no, always but wanted it. it's just it. the idea that you hear something about Crackdown, it's kind of like the boy who cried wolf, right? It's like, uh... Uh, you keep talking about it, but I mean, yeah, they need to not talk about it ever again until it's released. <laughs> ever again, drop a stealth release and make it. No, out. honestly, yeah, be like, it's out. Go enjoy, live your lives, cracking down on the city. <laughs> That's there you go. 
Maybe we should get in touch with him, Stammer. Speaking of yeah, Half Life, a, a little a little side note I wanted to sneak in. Um, it happened um, over the weekend, I believe, or last weekend, a couple of days ago from when we recorded the show. Uh, the Portal 2 co writer, Jay Pinkerton, is back at Valve. Uh, Variety reported that Pinkerton has returned to the company in an undisclosed role a year after he left. Uh, this is, of course, sourced by PC Gamer. Reddit user Owl Overlord. Owl Overlord? I don't know how to say that name. Sorry. Spotted uh, Pinkerton's name listed on Valve's staff page in the other experts category. Pinkerton is perhaps best known, of course, for writing Portal 2 with former Valve scribe Eric Wolpop and also reportedly worked on Team Fortress 2 comics and the Left 4 Dead series. Mm. Hmm. Confirmed. Rub's Portal beard. 3 confirmed. Confirmed. No. Oh, that would make me so no, happy, though. That'd be really great, but I don't know that that would happen. I don't know that Valve cares anymore at this point. I don't think they're they They're top do. their big old pile of money. Yeah. It would be hard yeah. to care from your castle made of money. <laughs> Dude. Like, just like, why? Really? Like, because anything you put out is almost like a net loss for the company at this point. Even if it makes some money, it's not worth the amount of time you probably spent on it. <laughs> oh, that's such a... That's such a salty Steimer way of thinking about it. Oh my gosh. I don't know. I just think, like, well, otherwise, why haven't they? <laughs> I guess artifacts coming out at some point. Yeah, but like, they, have, they have nothing to lose. They have so much surplus in funds to be able to develop something like this. I don't think they would lose money. If anything, no. they would no, no, gain no, no. money because mean, their fans yeah. are so like ravenous for something that for them to publish. You know, like a card, a Dota card game. Only Dota fans want that. And maybe even Give most Dota fans else. don't want that. Who knows? That was the saddest thing to me. That announcement. Yeah, yeah it, that was weird. I was just like, oh, oh, oh. I think okay. we all are in agreement there that that was like the biggest letdown. But then again, maybe we let our expectations kind of run away from us. I mean, yeah. Because yeah. I'm like, where's another portal or a Left 4 Dead or something brand new that you've been working on and haven't told anybody? I would be down for any of those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Throw my money at them in the face. Be like, here, have some more. Shove it in their mouth. Take some more. <laughs> Shove it. That's so aggressive. Yeah. Just... I aggressively want their products. Yes, you do. That means I have to aggressively give them their money. If I have to feed money into their mouth holes, I will. As well. Do you understand? Do you understand that I want the thing? Here. I don't Listen, think like, that I they. I don't think that money is is doing it for them because no, clearly, as Stemmer said, they have a lot it of needs money. To be, yeah. The. The motivation behind that has to be like creativity and creative fulfillment for those developers. Because otherwise, yeah. there's literally no reason to do it because they've got so much money they don't need it anymore. Truth. Capitalism. Make more money. Speaking of making more money, there is a new version of Destiny 2. <laughs> if this Sounds game good. could get just That's one more release, it. I think I need to add like an eighth disc to my Destiny disc collection. Um, there was also a Rocket League Ultimate Edition announcement as well that's coming in August with all of its DLC. Speaking of uh, games that have already been released coming with all their DLC. I bring this up because we did have uh, some people reach out to me on Twitter asking if I was going to be talking about Destiny 2's uh, Solstice event, which is happening. Sadly, I haven't gotten enough time with it. I've gotten enough time to log in, look at the decorations in the tower, go see Ikora, where you can begin doing all these story missions over again, and that's it. Uh, because we have to fly to Austin. <laughs> so we're uh, recording the show early this week. We'll be back on our normal schedule next week. So um, over on Polygon, they wrote that Bungie announced alongside a new trailer for Destiny 2 Forsaken, that the entire game will now be purchasable in one complete package. The Destiny 2 Legendary Collection will come with the base game, Curse of Osiris, Warmind, and Forsaken, the game's upcoming expansion. This collection should come as a welcome offering to new players and those that wish to switch platforms in the launch of the upcoming expansion. Like the Taken King before it, Forsaken will require players to own all of Destiny 2's year one content in order to play. I know that's a uh, question we get frequently like what do I have to play in order to be able to play Forsaken so now it's definitive you need to have everything in order to be able but to you play need to have played everything um, no so when we talked to Deej back at E3 when they announced Forsaken he told us that there will be like a, a little item that you can use to right. level your one of your characters up 
so that you can start playing into the story content right away. But that being said, you can go get 400 power armor right now. Why, why wouldn't you want to? Um, in, in the Destiny Reddit, uh, if you guys are big Destiny fans, you're kind of looking for some guidance. Or if you want to get back in, maybe your friends are playing or maybe you're like Brit and Jason and you're like, oh, I just wanted to jump back in and see how it's going. There is a, a great thread over on the Destiny subreddit uh, that gives you all of the tips and tricks on how to get that 400 level light level power armor. Des uh, Brett, you want to play some Solstice? I think I do. Steimer, are you in? I think I do. Uh, I still have to re-download Destiny 2 on my PlayStation. How dare you? You deleted it? It was deleted a long time ago. What? We played not that long ago. Oh. I deleted it after that. Wow. <laughs> Popcorn gif. Popcorn wow. Gif. And I need to re Well, I didn't realize it, and then I went and looked for it on my PlayStation. I was like, it's all oh, it's gone. Oh, I must have deleted this at some point. That's fine. I see I see what you think of the What's Good Guardians. We're deletable will... to you. you. Just oh, deleted shit. us without wow, a care in the world. This about the community. That's not fair. <laughs> not fair at all. That's okay. I'll take it. This is when I like awkwardly start playing with my microphone cord. You like? I was like, you just turtled up, Brittany. You're like turtle. <laughs> Don't fight, friends. I love you. No, we're I'm not fighting. Go. She knows that I'm just, uh, I'm just being facetious. Throwing her under the, the sparrow. See what I did there? Yeah, that was good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. No, I've been thinking about Destiny too lately. It's like one of those things. Again, I something about the summer. Something about the idea of running around and having random, random dance parties. And I like it when people are in the inventory and you crouch and you walk up to them and you move them around the the tower. That's my favorite thing to do to people. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're like, I really like about, I My favorite thing is to jump on people's heads. But that's always that? been my thing in MMOs. Like, or, I don't know heads. it's not an MMO, but like anything, any group game that allows you to, I will try to jump on your head. That is just the thing I'm going to do. If we've grouped up. And yes, you kind of can't. Like, you can stay there about, like, a half a second. Like, you can't. Unless you get it perfectly. But I think for the most part, you kind of jump on and then you slide off. But it's fun and I do it all the time. So, yeah. like, hi, jump on your head. I jump on your head. How how long do you think you need to, you sink, you need to sink into this expansion to, like, get the most out of it? Because I, I want to hop in, but I'm like, I have a lot of other shit I got to play. You mean Forsaken? This you mean the solstice event? Because it's an Sorry. event. It's not a. That's what I meant. The sol like, how much time do you put into it to get everything? Do you, or my... end? When does to it get end? everything? I mean, probably a lot. Because, I mean, you have to grind your way up to the 400 power armor. You can't. It doesn't just, like, just drop. You it's know, not you... birthed at 400. Yeah, well, I mean, oh, and you have yeah, to do the prestige raid layer, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so in order to get there, you've got to, you know, grind for your light level. I mean, they've added some things to make it a little bit easier. And now you've got your moments of triumph as well to kind of like check off the list uh, for all of you RPG fans out there who like to have like a list of things you need to go like check off. Um, there's a lot to do. It's I mean, it's about the journey, not the destination, Brit. The destiny but it's called destiny. <laughs> but destiny and destination are two different words. <laughs> But they're, they're just, made of the same. They just share some common letters, okay? They share a lot of common letters. But also, Brittany, to answer your question, this ends on August 28th. Okay. So, right before, yeah, then. right before uh, Forsaken launches. Uh, I need like three of me so I can play all these games. But that's fine. This is fine. Yeah. You'll work fine. it no, out. The room it's is on good, fire. It's a good it's problem fine. to have. I want to play. I want to do more. And I will. Definitely, I'll be playing Forsaken. Good. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap up our news segment for this week. Hopefully something really exciting happens between when we recorded the show and when it airs. And you'll be like, oh, gee, I can't believe they missed this thing. And maybe we'll talk about it next week. But until then, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what we have been playing because apparently Brittany is overflowing with things that she's busy with. I mean, she's really just playing Octopath Traveler. Let's be real. Um, that's right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is segment two of the What's Good Games podcast, where we talk about what we've been playing this week. And unfortunately, I haven't been playing very much. So hopefully you ladies have. Uh, right before we went on the break, I talked, of course, about Octopath Traveler, which, Britt, I know you're playing. And um, Steimer, you have taken a little bit of a break from Octopath. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm going to be picking it back up when I fly to Austin. Uh 
but yes, I have. I've taken a sick break from doing a lot of things in life. Sometimes you just got to sleep. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, Alex wrote in to Dear WGG, which, of course, you can learn about at whatsgoodgames.com slash Dear WGG, and writes, I'm a game developer in a dream job. I'm working on a new game in an old franchise. I grew up playing as a kid together with my sister and my dad. Many folks on the team have similar stories, and we're all super excited to share this thing we love with old fans as well as newcomers. But we face many challenges, and I was hoping for your thoughts on one of them. We're working on a strategy game without naming the franchise, Imagine games like Homeworld, Warcraft 3, Age of Empires, or Northgard. I found that a lot of players are quickly put off by strategy games when they encounter them for one reason or another. And as somebody who wants to share the things I love, I've spent a lot of time thinking of how to make the fun in the genre stand out and draw new people in. Since you've recently talked about the intimidating impression JRPGs can make on some people, I was wondering what your experiences with strategy games like this have been and what you think the genre could do to be more inviting and encourage more people to experience the fun they can hold. All the best. Well, Alex, I'm glad you asked. So I have been playing a game called Spell Force 3. I talked about this a little bit last year. It's developed and published by Grimlore Games and THQ Nordic, and it's an old school like CRPG slash RTS game. And the reason I stopped playing it last year was because it had a lot of technical issues. The game would crash while playing co-op. Like you literally could not proceed. But it's been a healthy like, you know, nine months since I last tried playing it. So, or eight months I should say. So Jason and I hopped back in, we're like 10 to 12 hours in. And what I love about this game is the old school RPG. You know, you have inventory management, you have different skill trees, you can, you level up individually your attributes like constitution, dexterity, intelligence, um, health and power and all that stuff. So it has that old school feeling to it. Take a shot every time I say old school. However, where I am completely and utterly lost is the strategy element. So the game does a really good job at seamlessly being like, all right, you're exploring this dungeon, and now, oh, you got to build troops and conquer these sectors and do these things that I have never done in a video game before. So Jason grew up playing these games, so he's over there buzzing 90 miles an hour, and I'm just sitting there like, what the hell? I can take you through any dungeon crawl you want, baby girl, or baby boy in his case. But don't <laughs> ask me conquering sectors and... and finding food and stone and wood. I'm like, what the hell is all of this? And now you have to build barracks and watchtowers. And resources. And resources, yeah. So I'm getting it now. But I, I had a, a ping of, of empathy or sympathy for Andrea when she was talking about how JRPG is. She's like, I just don't freaking get it. And I'm sitting there playing this RTS, and I'm like, what the hell am I doing? This is really confusing. This doesn't make a lot of sense. And I... I don't know why, like, for some reason, it's just having a really hard time clicking. I'm thinking if Jason be really patient with me, I'll understand it. But, um, I don't, I like, I do like, the, I like, it's different. And I like the strategy element of it. Now, Stickly is out for Steimer. Oh, so what I was saying is, real-time strategy is very intense, I suppose. Or, like, it's difficult to learn because it is real-time. And so the AI is moving. So you always feel like you are behind because you're like, you don't have a chance to catch up. So I would say anybody who's interested in strategy games should start with like a turn-based strategy game. Because then you have your whole turn, you can sit, you can figure out what it is you want to do, you can kind of mull it over before making your move. It's like more like chess in that sense. Although people probably would get mad at you if you played chess in real life. And sat no, there forever. you're right, because I'm playing and it's like, you've lost a sector, you have gained a sector, you've lost a sector, they're like, oh, the uppity. And we spent literally three hours last night on a skirmish that we had to completely scrap and start over. Because it was just like, I was like, oh my god. I don't yeah, know if, if I agree with you, Steimer. Doing... What? I said, I don't know if I agree with you about you should that you should do turn-based before you get into real time to kind of practice. Because I think that's kind of the thrill of RTS games is having to like micromanage all of the different things at the same time and kind of take like the, the, the macro view and the micro view and kind of always knowing like what your troops are doing over here and what your uh, harvesters are doing over here or, or what your vanguard is doing over here, obviously depending, you know, like what kind of game you're playing. But that's what I always really loved about RTS. And the re main reason I just don't play RTS right now is because all of the good RTSs, well, not all of them, I take that back. That's too much of an umbrella statement. Most of the good RTSs are on PC. And I just never play at the PC out here in the studio. Um, a couple of people have recommended some 
console RTSs to me, but let's be honest, like, I mean, RTSs is really it's, made for PC. Yeah, like, because you get the mouse, you've got better precision, you can kind of, like, I don't know, it feels better to control it with a mouse and keyboard than it does to control it with a, with a mouse, or not a mouse, with a stick. Um, but so my point was more, like, if, say you are somebody who's try, just trying to learn, Andrea, and, like, you get in and you already feel like you're getting stomped, like, that's not a great feeling. So I think it's just really important if you are building an RTS to have a really good entryway into that like tutorial. build have a good we'll have a good tutorial but also just have a lot of people skip tutorials so like make sure that the ramp of your game like makes sense and is a ramp and is not just like ta-da you are going to immediately be dropped off this cliff Who and skips tutorials oh, a lot of people a lot of boring. people do um and so my point with return base is more like if the thought of the other opponent moving at the same time you are, is too anxiety <laughs> inducing. Maybe that's just not the genre for you. And then you, but you could still enjoy strategy games. It, it just might be like a different type of strategy. That was all my, my point was, because I've played both. Um, growing up, my, all my dad plays is strategy games. He plays both turn and, and uh, real time. He also, like you, Andrea, enjoys real time more than turn based, because um, he likes, the movement and like once you get used to it it's great right like that is the thrill of playing those games like you said um but i think it's very intimidating to start out in those genres because because of that same reason so, yeah. so what makes it good also makes it really stressful really scary yeah it's definitely one of the more intense gaming experiences i've had where i feel completely and totally like a fish out of water like a magic carp out of water if you will and it's like, what? So he's over here building me. We're being attacked from this sector. We're losing things. And I'm like, what the hell are we doing? But I think for me, um, what made it inviting was the fact that there was, you know, typical RPG elements within it. So I don't think without there was that, I would. familiar for you. Right, right. Something familiar. And so I'm excited to get past this RTS. Parks. I know after that is something I'm familiar with, so I'm happy dealing with like the super stressful, high anxiety time because it's it is fun to learn, and I'm excited to get better at it. So he and I can actually like collaborate on plans rather than me just standing around like playing with my turd fidget spinner, which is like it's like the turd emoji fidget spinner, and I just like sit there and like spin it while I'm trying to watch him like what he's doing. I want to be able to work on it with him, and um, I think I really could end up liking the RTS genre. It's just it's just a little bit What's... of a learning curve. But this question actually reminds me of, do you guys remember, oh my god, what the fuck is the name of this game? Oh, it just flew out of my head. Uh, the Tim Schafer game, it was like metal themed, and it looked oh, like an action Brutal game. Legend. But then it, yes, Brutal Legend. So my favorite part about this game was how they marketed it like an action game and just completely ignored the fact that it turns into a strategy game after like an hour. That's why I stopped playing it. I didn't get it. <laughs> so like... Maybe don't do that. Maybe don't try and trick your audience into thinking it's a completely different game than it yeah. is. But I just thought that was really funny because he's like, what can they do? I'm like, well, if you want to go the brutal, re brutal legend route, you just don't tell anyone that you are a strategy game. Yeah. And uh, you let them. But I would recommend the game. If it sounds like something you're interested, I think you would really like Spellforce 3. Most of the bugs have been worked out. We haven't come across any since we played. And it's a, it's a fun little throwback. PC only at this time. Cool. Yeah. I'll have to... Probably never check that out. Let's be honest. Yeah, there you go. When you said, when we, yeah, when you started, let's said, be I'll honest. You, I was like, uh, I started it being like, ah, no, no, no. Yeah. no I'm probably never lie. going Don't to play this. I like being honest. <laughs> Thing. I really just want somebody to remaster or remake Dune Two. That was my favorite RTS of all time on PC back in the day. Oh, Ooh. Dune. Did you guys ever Happened. watch those? Read the books? Sci-fi? No. no? Mm -hmm. You're missing out. Mm -mm. It's all about Shia Lude, man. Okay. Um, <laughs> next. I played a game on my Switch. It's called Pool Panic. So like Brittany it. and Wait, I... Is that the one? What was that? Somebody was talking about this at some point. Was it the one with the crazy balls? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes with the crazy balls. Um, so <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's what she said. Um, so... This game, Brett and I saw at the Nindies event at GDC back in March. And we got a chance to play it there. And that's how I discovered this puzzle game. It's a it's a 2D puzzle game where, as Steimer mentioned, there are crazy balls. So essentially, it's kind of like a mashup of golf and billiards. And it's a, they're set 
um, kind of like on a billiards table, but the, very non-traditional. And the mechanics are you use uh, the sticks on the switch to control your pool cue. And then you hit the cue ball into the other balls to make them go into the holes. But there's like a par system. So each course that you do is like, oh, you have this many hits with the cue stick in order to get all of the balls in the holes. And then when you don't do that, you start going into negative numbers. Um, and it's been really both simultaneously funny and frustrating to play because the puzzles ramp up pretty quickly. The first run, I was like, oh, this isn't bad. I got this. And then the second one, I was like, oh, I made some mistakes. Let me do that over. And then the third one, I was at like negative 10 and I was like, crap. <laughs> Um, and it just continues to get a little bit more challenging from there because the balls start to take on personalities. They will get up and move around. They will move while you're attempting to hit them. Some of them have... That's just cheating. I know. That's what I said. It's not fair. It makes me really angry, but it's really funny. Well, as we learned in the movie Labyrinth, life's not fair. It's true. Can someone just please hold up a bat? I'll hold up my sign. Thanks. Oh, that's what she uh, is it because I'm just talking about the balls all the time. Just balls about taking balls on personalities, <laughs> balls walking around. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I... Are you sorry though? You're not no, sorry. Not. That's you my new be. goal of the year to stop saying I'm sorry when I'm really not sorry because it's like it's meant as like a haha, I'm sorry, but it's like no, you're really not sorry. So that's why are you, you saying sorry, I'm sorry, not yeah. sorry? Yeah, sure. You like, yeah, when you want to like mock sorry, sorry, not yeah. sorry. So I got to meet right. some of the team from Rem uh, Re Rekim? Re uh, Rekim. I always say the right. name of their studio wrong. I apologize if you're yeah. listening. <laughs> um, they're the, the folks who have made this game. Of course, it's been published by Adult Swim Games. I got to chat with them at San Diego Comic-Con because they did a tournament with uh, Kind of Funny and Adult Swim Games at their big outdoor park that they had. And so they uh, very graciously gave me a code to check out the game. I was planning on buying this anyway. It's actually not a very expensive game. And it's just like a nice, fun puzzle game to have on my Switch when I'm on flights and, and doing things. And I, sometimes I'll have to put it down because I just get stuck on a level and I just keep making mistakes after mistakes. Because a lot of it is not just figuring out like how to get all of the different characters into their holes. <laughs> nice into their <laughs> respective places yes um but also you know you have to get precision with lining up the shot and making sure that you're using you know a, a power shot versus like a soft shot you know just like in regular pool the right amount of force yeah exactly you, you don't want to hit the stick too hard uh, oh yeah. my gosh there's just it's, <laughs> it's useless <laughs> There's no way to talk about this game without it making sound like I'm talking about sex in some kind of a way. Um, but I've, I've been really enjoying my time with it. Um, this is exactly a perfect example of another fantastic indie shining on the Nintendo Switch. Um, it is also available on Steam. And I'm not sure what other platforms it's on. Let me double check here. Um, yes, I think it's just Steam and Switch right now. There you go. Yeah. There you go. The two S's. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, if you guys want to check that out, Pool Panic is what it's called. And they've got all... I want to give a... I'll wait for you. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to switch gears a little bit. To yeah. The path. Go for okay. it. Mm. All right. So oh, wait, there was something the... I didn't read. Okay. Do you want to read that WGG or should I read that now? Or do you want to wait till after? What gear do you want to switch to first? Your gear or my gear? Your gear. We'll come back to this. Okay. So, uh, when we've talked about Octopath Traveler in the past podcasts, now I'm now maybe 35 hours in, and one of the things we talked about was the lack of communication between the individual characters, because we'd be like, we would love to see how these characters interact with each other. I will say that now that I'm about halfway through the chapter twos of the game, there are dialogue options where you'll, something will happen in a certain character story, and then depending on which party members are with you, that will trigger a dialogue between the two of them. So, oh, okay. I've hey. come across that. So maybe I've had like six conversations between party members, which again, you know, it's it's not ideal. But I did want to say like I'm aware of that now because some people were like, "We'll just wait until you get further in the game." And now I understand why. It's a cool touch. And like the, the conversations no, they ahead. have, the conversations they do have are really interesting, and it's fun to see their personalities, you know, shine against each other or whatever the hell that's. I don't know. I just made that up. But the Play point is. It me, thank you. It makes me want more, right? And I, and I feel like that's a good thing, but also like, why 
might not, why couldn't you have more of this? But I'm still absolutely loving the game. It's just getting more and more fun, I feel like. And I love the challenge. I spent like a day and a half just grinding. That's all I did. So now I'm way OP. But like grinding in games are just so, it's so relaxing to me and it's so much fun. What, Simer? I just remember your tweet about the, where you used bewildering dance and then like oh. got totally fucked. Oh, man. That sucks. Hey, she- I had <laughs> no idea what that tweet means and I still don't. Okay. Let oh. me explain it to you. Yeah. So. I gotta pull it up because I have to remember Primrose exactly. Primrose dancer. She's one of the characters that you can have in your party. Right. And one of the moves she does is called bewildering grace. Bewildering grace, because and so how it works is that she dances, and when she dances for you, she'll you'll she'll incite a random uh, effect. So she could double your experience points by two, by five, by a thousand. Your your job points. You could get more money. She could set you all on. She could poison everyone. She could cause an explosion. She could heal the enemies. Like you never know what you're gonna get. But people do this because it's an efficient. It can be, if you're lucky, an efficient way of grinding and getting experience points. Because in order to grind in this game, it's not like other games that I've played in this genre where it's like you know you just go fight, 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 and it quickly goes up, up, and up. It's like you have to go to a super duper over op area. It's a slow grind. It's a very slow grind. So anyway, so people are saying this is the way you do it. You have Primrose grind, uh, dance for you. I almost said grind. You have Primrose dance for you. you maybe you'll get lucky. I think it's like a 1% chance she'll, she'll get like... <laughs> we'll have her dance for you and maybe you'll get lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, buddy. Phrasing. This kind of doesn't work, but I'm going to use it anyway. No, it works. And so you, what you want are, you know, the buffs. You want experience points boost. You want money boost. You want job points boost. Make your life easier in the game. So I spent, you know, like a good couple hours doing this. And she was just like, she can't dance for shit. I don't know what her problem is. I don't know if she was hungover. All I know is she was bad juju. She was bad luck. So she was just debuffing you constantly. She was just debuffing me, yeah. And so she, you know, you save up your battle points so she can do like four dances a turn as opposed to one. So I'm saved up all these points. I'm like, all right baby girl, you dance for me. And she depleted all of my battle points, which means I was weak as hell. It means it basically got rid of all my skill points and not my, my ability to buff myself. Andrew's eyes are probably glazing over right now. And then a monster yeah. appeared. I just she want you to keep monster. talking about dancing. Yeah. So she danced. Yeah. And then she summoned a monster. <laughs> the monster healed all of the, mo- all of the enemies on screen. And then she reduced all of my hit points to one and one fell swoop. And I was like, what the hell? So I gave up she on that. She fucked you quick. real good. Oh, yeah, I gave did. up on her. I said, you're going, your level 14 ass is going back in my party, and it's you're not getting one level higher. I'm done with you. She's going back in the tavern. I mean, She's that's been... a lot to take. I was very upset about it. I mean, it was funny, but it was also like, damn, girl, because you've done anything worse. Yeah, than like, that. could you, you rolled real bad. Real bad. I Nothing feel like they shouldn't that. do that to you. Why, why would they make that a possibility? <laughs> Because it's a it's a risk reward. It's like you use this thing, and either you can get super leveled. Like I think I saw a Sky Williams video where he went up five level, four, five six levels in like one battle, or you get super fucked, and then you have to like try and, got, and get your way out of it. Super fucked, super duper fucked in that one. Yeah, in that instance, that was real bad. That was a real bad one. People understood who like you know. Yeah, who tried to use the primrose method. Yeah. Of- no, Dang I found it. the best way is to go to like it's called like Specter Pass or Specter Wood or something, and it's like a level like 26 area and just freaking grind there for a couple hours. Anyway, woo, woo, woo. Also, I got my grandma playing the game and she loves it. Oh yeah. Has she gotten her Primrose Dancer yet? No. Has she has she encountered the recklessness of people doing grace? No. And I'm gonna tell her stay away. You're like stay She's away like from that though. Primrose. She's trouble. She's like me. She's like, I'm going to be up at 2 in the morning leveling up. I'm like, yes, you are, Grandma, because you're a bomb ass. I love that your grandma can stay up that late. My grandma cannot. Yeah, she does. She's cool. She's cute. Cool. Cool. Some uh, some dirty you dancing wanna, happening in an Octopath Traveler. Here, this is one of those moments. See, this is what we're going to talk about when we do podcasting <laughs> 101. Yes. Our, our, our Bruce Turti. <laughs> Over the internet. There's sometimes, weird lag sometimes. Sometimes there's lag. Sometimes two people talk at the same time and we all just stare at each other. And then like, nobody wait, talks waiting for somebody to talk and then there's dead air. But we're, we're not doing a live radio show, thankfully. This is a, a podcast. And so hopefully you guys don't mind an awkward pause every now and again. Uh, <laughs> let's fill that awkward silence with another 
right in from a dear WGG patron. Mr. Gregory Horton writes and says, Hi, ladies. Happy pre-lated birthday, Andrea. I like that. That's cute. Uh, for your birthday, I have some Bungie-related news to share. The Destiny Grimoire Anthology Volume 1 is now available for pre-order on Bungie's website. This hardcover book will contain 128 pages and will perfectly contain all of the in-game Destiny lore pertaining to its volume. Volume 1 is titled Dark Mirror. There will be more <laughs> volumes to come from Bungie in the future. The book is $24.99 and all books contain an in-game code for a Destiny 2 emblem called Codex Doctrine that will be available once the book ships in fall 2018. P.S. My birthday is actually on the day you will be recording this 731. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Gregory Holt! <laughs> it's always a pleasure to meet a fellow Leo that loves kicking butt in Destiny. Ah, thank you Mr. Horton. That's very kind of you. Um, I did not know that they were making this book so thank you for telling me. As we were talking about in the last section of the show, I'm definitely looking forward to jumping in and playing some more Solstice and and taking off some of the boxes on my Moments of Triumph. Though I never get them all because there's always too many Crucible things in the Moments of Triumph for me to get. Even though I have played substantially more Crucible um, in Destiny 2 than I played in the original Destiny. But that being said... I'm never going to get them all. I just, I unfortunately have to spread up my time. These ladies would murder me if I talked about Destiny 2 every week on this show. I have to play. Just let me talk about Resident Evil every show. You can talk about Destiny 2. I will not judge you. Um, um, no, I, I think I'm thing. down to make the deal where neither of us do that. Oh. <laughs> also, hey, For the I, of the I allowed you to get away with that. With that jab that you gave me on the postcard this month, okay? Oh, that was such good I post. mean, it was also on me. Yeah, it was on both of you. Don't don't flatter yourself, Andrea Renee. <laughs> it was on both of you. <laughs> but I actually, I'm very excited about this grimoire book because that's one of the things I've talked about with Destiny is I want the lore, I want the, the story. It's interesting, and I feel like we only get a little piece of it through the game. So I think I'm going to pre-order this bad boy and actually, like, read it. Color Anyone me else? unsurprised. Uh, that's true. 128 pages seems... Seems short, but it's maybe it's long. Back. I think, yeah, he said there'd be more volumes to come, so it's probably just part one. Isn't it like a coffee table book? Actually, um, you know, it's hard. To, no, it says the dimensions are 7.75 inches by 10 inches, so that's like a pretty like mm. standard size book. Coffee table book is usually like a solid, like, like yeah, they're bigger. Yeah, it's massive. Well, I thought if they had. Maybe I completely misunderstood this. But it is uh, being made I in did. partnership with Blizzard it was Entertainment. More of an art book, no, it, it goes into the lore, the history, all of the things. I'm reading about it right now. It says on uh, on bu on bungiestore.com, it says, until now, the myths and machinations of the Destiny universe were found hidden throughout the world, enticing threads that hinted at a greater tapestry. The Destiny <laughs> Grimoire Anthology weaves tales from multiple sources together for the first time, casting new light on Destiny's most legendary heroes, infamous villains, and their greatest moments of triumph and tragedy. Okay, see so you now. The problem is you didn't this. put it in the I... game here by this book. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, like I feel like Dragon Age has the world or the history of Thetis or the world of Thetis, which is their huge, super uber history lore book. And that makes sense because, I mean, hot diggity damn, that game has so much lore that they can't possibly fit it into one. I mean, they could fit it into one game. But I feel like the game itself gives you so much interesting lore and backstory and it presents itself to you. And in Destiny 2, I'm like, what's happening? Who are you? All I know is K6 is my boy. It's not that bad. I probably exaggerated a bit. I do enjoy the story that we do see in Destiny 2, but it's just not enough. I I like that they're calling them Grimoire. Grimoire. I, like I just like the name Grimoire. Grimoire. Yeah, so I, I originally felt the same, and I'm trying to open my perspective on this a little bit because um, I'll tell you why. Uh, after I hosted the Division 2 panel at San Diego Comic-Con, I had made a joke during the panel about how many cell phone recordings you have to pick up in the division because there's so there's over a hundred there's so many and they all contribute a little piece of lore to the overall um, narrative that's happening in the division which is and their story is really hard to piece together because there's so many individual pieces of intel that you have to go and hunt down and find and I had just made an offhand joke about it being like hey could you make a few less cell phone recordings that I have to go hunt down and a surprising amount of people clapped back at me about this jo this joke that I made saying, I can't believe you would want less. I live for hunting down those things. 
<coughs> excuse me. I, I can't believe that you're too lazy to walk around the world and pick up all of the pieces of lore. And Jeez. I was like, too lazy. I was like, hold on. No, 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 no. I want you to tell me a story. <laughs> Sing me the song of my people, or rather your people, whatever it is that I you're feel doing. Like those are usually reserved for backstories and like uh, optional lore that you don't really need to know about. Yeah. So this yeah, was my that. point too, was that, hey, I'm not trying to say that they should take lore out of the game. I was just saying, maybe we can cut the number of pieces that I have to pick up in half. 75 is still a lot of collectibles to go pick up in a single game that's open world and gigantic. And that was just one type of intel. There were several other kinds of intel, but it reminds me a lot of what you know Destiny did to really stretch out the gameplay loop to say if you really want to dig in and find all of these pieces of lore, you have to go pick up like every single ghost. You have to read the text on all of the gear. You have to read the text on the weapons. You have to go into your grimoire cards on the Bungie website. You know, like back in like vanilla destiny, looking at the grimoire was actually like a task. You know, they've made it a little bit easier over the years, but I think something like this is fantastic to put it all together because let's be honest, I'm not going to go back and pick up every dead ghost. I know that there are plenty no. of websites. Oh, oh, sad. I know. Um, there are plenty of websites that have like Destiny fan sites that have put all of the grimoire and all of the lore together, but to put it in a nice like packaged book like this that is going to contain, what, according to like the, the promotional photo they have on the, on the website, it looks like it's going to contain some pieces of concept art as well. And I think that that's um, I think that that's great. And I think that there's nothing wrong if you want to go out of your way to find those things. And I think it's fun that a lot of developers are putting hidden collectibles in the game. But I think it's not fair to the vast majority of gamers who don't have the time to go to every nook and cranny of an open world game or a massively multiplayer game to find these key pieces of lore. I think that there's nothing wrong with kind of appeasing both audiences and not only that but like when you when you do it the organic way through the game you're not necessarily getting it in an order that makes any sense it's just like you're kind of getting pieces here and there mm -hmm. so the book is very helpful in that like oh i can actually go through this in a logical fashion and sort of figure out what the hell is going on because one of the things that i've always liked the concept of the lore of destiny like i think the world is interesting but then anytime i feel like they talk, my eyes glaze over. And I don't know why, but I'm just like, it's, but I'm, so I'm curious when, when both of you buy this book, I will probably come over, Andrea, and thumb through it and like, see if it grabs me that way. Cause there's just something about it that like, I can't, can't quite get. And I don't know why. Cause I'm like, ah, just let's go shoot shit. I don't know. Well, yeah, no, that's fair. And I wonder if part of that's because they, there really isn't an emphasis on the story, right? Or these, these characters, that what we see, are, they're great, they're wonderful, and I think they're all different and unique in their own way. But when they talk, you don't have, let's say, and of course, like, you wouldn't expect this, but, like, that history and that, that solid whatever I'm looking for, like, you'd see in a character from, like, Dragon Age. When they talk, you're invested in them because you know a lot about them, you know a lot about their history and their story and the world around them. And when these characters talk, I thought, I mean, I, my eyes never glazed over. I thought what they had to say was interesting, and I liked the way they said it because you can see hints of that personality back there. But I'm not super invested in them because I don't know a lot about the, them and their history, I guess, the world going around them. Anyway. No, that's, I think the only so one that doesn't is Cade because it's Nathan Fillion and his delivery is so good. Oh, yeah. They're like, I would just listen to him tell me the story of everything. But, <laughs> like... There, there are a few characters when they talk, and I'm just like, okay. Yeah. But they do have some very fun characters, too. I'm not trying to, like, yeah. be a total Debbie Downer. Um, I think my she other favorite shit. was Failsafe. Is that her name? Yeah, oh, the yeah. Uh, the kind of the GLaDOS lookalike. I really like Murderous Robot. <laughs> really good. Yeah, she's Make great. Those, I think, obviously, any Destiny fan will tell you Destiny's you know greatest lore weakness is that we don't have enough backstory on any of these characters. Uh, you know, like the the queen and her brother from the first game, which, you know, hopefully we're going to get to hear more about. You know, the stranger, um, even all of the vanguards. You know, it's just like there's just so many, there's so much potential for really deep storytelling. And even like you look at like an expansion like the Curse of Osiris, and you have this really amazing fictional character in Osiris and who he was. And then we never even get to meet the guy. And I'm just like, wait, what? Yeah. I think my biggest annoyance was when I went to the Queen in Destiny 1 and I was an Awoken and 
uh, she said nothing about that. Yeah. And I was like, lady, I'm clearly one of you. Shouldn't you address me in a different way? <laughs> like, <laughs> hello? No? Cool. We're just going to ignore the fact that I'm an Awoken sweet. Awesome. Yeah. God damn. Indeed. Like, there's only three races in this game. It's not like there were 16 of them or something, and it would have been really hard. She just didn't care about you, Steimer. You're preaching Sorry. to the choir, I mean, Steimer. I know. Um, I know, I know. So, do you want to talk about the book you've been reading here? Or should we wait and save it for the next segment? Oh, we can do that. Yeah, we can save it. Okay, cool. I, I just, yeah, I as I've said, I've been, I've had the cough of death, but am now on the mend because all I did this weekend was sleep uh, and go, you know, hang out with Andrea for a bit. But otherwise, it, this weekend was all about healing because we got to go to Austin, and I was like, I want to be okay for Austin. I don't want to feel like this. Um, so it worked. Haha, -ha, I will not be that dad. That's it. Like PAX East was miserable. So I was like, I just cannot redo PAX East. So you won't. And I won't. We're going to wrap you in a bubble. The Steimer in the plastic good. bubble. It's going to be yes, great. Please. All mm -hmm. right, everybody stick with us. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we've got some of your questions and we're going to listen to Steimer talk about a cool book she's reading. Uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. It's segment three of the What's Good Games podcast. And normally, we have uh, some kind of rhyme or reason to what's happening in this third segment. But not today. It's going to uh -huh. be a cornucopia of questions and topics. We're going to start out with... <laughs> I, saw, I saw you. My legs were sticky to my chair, and it was a very sticky, sweaty, gross situation, so I had to ply them off. You got to put a little towel doing. down, like a little blanket or something. That makes too much sense. A little sweat towel. Oh, yeah, girl. I do it all I the time. Send it to you? One of you want it after I'm done with it? I mean, yeah, no, but you could if probably you sign sell it. it on the internet. Uh, well, maybe we'll make a What's Good Game sweat towel. It'll be great. Steimer, Steimer's like, yeah, only if you sign it. Andrew's like, uh, no. <laughs> well, you I know, mean, we've by got the time I got here, it's not like it would be sweaty anymore. That's true. No. It would have a stench, but I like it. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> oh, my God. This got weird really quickly. You um, chopsticks in your hand? So, yes, I do. So, I'm eating. I just needed a little something. I found these flaming hot pretzel chips. I thought you were going to say flaming hot Cheetos. No, so it's the same like dust that's on the flaming hot Cheetos, but it's on these rolled gold pretzel chips. Ooh. Oh, weird. And so I'm I eating them with today, chopsticks, and otherwise it. it makes my fingers bright red. Play by play. Oh, that's what the chopsticks are for. Okay. Yeah. It's a clever way of getting around that. I want a reaction. Fingers. Are they flaming hot? Are, well, they, are they good? I've actually never had flaming hot Cheetos. <gasps> They're actually really delicious. They They're not that me hot. With the name flaming hot, like no. you've you've terrified me with your marketing. They're only yeah, hot if you can't handle any level of spice. I can handle very little. They're very little. Okay. Yeah, you'll be fine. They're not bad. I'll hand feed you some next time. Please do. So, Steimer. Yeah. That's me. You've been reading A Secret History of Witches. I've been reading a book because I don't know. That's what I do. Um, yeah. So I started reading this book. And honestly, even when I was like only on the first 20 pages, I immediately texted Andrea and I said, oh, I just saw her drop a flaming hot Cheeto pretzel. Her. On her white shirt. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. She's wearing white. This is a disaster. Oh, dear. Um, oh, there's definitely red dust all smushed on me you now. Whatever. <laughs> YOLO. <I'm> fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, so as I was like, just I've read much more now, but even when I hadn't read very much of it, I was like, this book's awesome, and I think Andrea would really like it. So as the title indicates, this is about a family of witches. Um, and so it kind of follows, it basically follows this entire genealogy, right? This whole line. So it starts out, I forget which year specifically in the 1800s at some point when they are burning witches. And so like, it's about the family fleeing persecution from these priests and how they manage it. And like when the grandmother dies, like they're 
pretty sure that nobody else has her power, her level of power. Um, and then, like, you kind of find out, like, one of them does, and then it, but then, like, as, it's just sort of, like, weird the way that the power is, like, going through generations, and they've written the characters really beautifully, so, like, each section of the book is a different era and a different, uh, not a storyteller, because they're not first-person perspective, but it's it's all written third person, but still, like, it's their story. So, like, the first one's the first child who is the youngest of, like, all of these sisters. And then it's her daughter and, like, so fo- so on and so forth. Um, but just it's really, really well written. It's very intriguing, and, like, the relationships are great. And it's – they're very strong women like and some of some of the things that they do you're just like fuck yeah you're like yes go I wish I was a witch I wish I had powers and this sounds cool um but they're not like it's not like Harry Potter witch to clarify it's more of what you think of as like a traditional like spells and like loose spells do they ride brooms and more of like prayers no there's no broom writing yeah. and like people making you making like a they call them something, and I forget the exact word, but, like, potions and that kind of stuff. Like, they can do little, like, small enchantments, and that's kind of their level of power. Um, but, yeah, it's been a really good read so far, and I look forward to continuing it. Is it for mature audiences, or is it for children? There's a little bit of sex, because that's how children are made, but it's not super... <laughs> <laughs> It's not, like, super in-depth on it. It's not, like, rated R. Or not, like, rated X or I don't know. what. What's the one after R? NC-17. Oh, yeah, NC-17. It's not that level. It's not, like, it's not, like, it's not, like, a, his, then his throbbing, whatever. Like, it's not, there's nothing like that. It's very tastefully done. Oh, okay. So there's baby making in this. That's awesome. A little bit. Is yeah, it... it's been really so. If you basically like the vibe you kind of get is if you've ever seen the movie Practical Magic with Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock, it's kind of like that but extended, like because the story is much longer and goes over the course of generations instead of just their family. Did you finish it? Not yet. I'm oh. like a third of the way through. Okay. I like it a lot. So last week we talked about a book. No one really liked that much, and now yeah. you can talk about a so book. Now you I want to really talk. Like. I want to talk about a book I really am liking. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. I need to get back into reading. I used to read so much. Just anymore, I'm like, uh. I think my problem is I always love to read before bed. But in my old age, as soon as I lay down, I'm like ready to sleep. I don't last like maybe 10 seconds before I'm out. and then it's just. But point. that means that you've uh, see, sleep do, trained yourself really me. well. That's a good thing. That I fall asleep so quickly? Yeah. Yes, that's very unusual. Doesn't that mean I'm just always like unknowingly tired? No. It just yeah. means that you, your body knows so that when good. you lay down in your bed... That it's time to go to sleep. Well, hallelujah. There you we did go. something right. I did it wrong, and now I read before bed, but it's fine. There's nothing um, wrong with reading before bed. I read before bed every night. It's part of my ritual. I love reading. Yeah. Sometimes I only read for 10 minutes. Sometimes I read for two hours. It's all about, like, yeah, one, how, how riveting the material I'm reading is, and two, how tired I am. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yep. Exactly that. But anyways, yeah. Cool. I like that's this. My, Maybe we'll start, like, a What's activity. Good Book Club or something. Yeah, we should. Yeah, it's been interesting on my my journey to get back into reading because reading was one of my was basically my first love in entertainment mm-hmm. things. Um, but I think the thing that would throw me off, and when I talk to my aunt, my aunt reads like crazy. She reads. She always has multiple books going. Like her video games is books. Like she just consumes mm-hmm. them like crazy. Uh, and so I was talking with her about this one that I was struggling with. It's called the Essex Serpent, and I was just really not finding my groove with it at all mm. wasn't latching me and I read like a hundred or so like over a hundred pages of it and she was like just put it just walk away she was like you can't because then you're gonna if you force yourself to finish this book because there's like 400 pages left <laughs> oh, wow. like, if you force yourself to finish this you're all you're it's gonna do is leave a distaste in your mouth and like you won't want to pick up that next book right away because you'll be like kind of put off um, and so I did I put it down I picked up a different book that I was more interested in, read that in, like really quickly, and then again was yeah like eager to pick up the next book. So I think that there is something to that. So if you find yourself being like, I'd like to read more, but I find it, I feel like I should be reading these types of books. Like don't do that to yourself. Find something that really genuinely interests you and that you think you can get through um, 
not necessarily quickly, but like get through and enjoy yourself mm-hmm. versus being like, I'm going to read this because I want to seem smart or I want to like <laughs> do something. Yeah. Cause like, I definitely have psychology books that are a bit dense. I still enjoy them, but I read them much slower and I, have to be careful with how frequently I read them because it is a little bit like when you're done with them, you're like, okay, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm tired now. <laughs> I, I definitely hear what you're saying about being able to walk away from a genre you don't like, but I've been in situations. Genre, it was a specific book, a specific writer and the way that they were writing. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I, when I first read the name of the wind by Patrick Rothfuss, which is now one of my favorite books, it took me like a solid, like 250 pages to get into that book. And that's a long book. Like that's too long. But like I was, but I, I could see what he was building. And now when I go back and reread that book, I appreciate all of the setup a lot more than I did the first time around. The first time around, I was like, man, this is so slow. Like what's happening? It was just like so much exposition. But now I can see the foundation that he's laid for the entire series, not just for what's going to happen in that book. And I have like so much more respect for it than I did the fir- during my first read through. So I would say if it's a highly recommended book that maybe you could potentially think about pushing through. But if you're really yeah, but- bored and really not enjoying it, but yeah, take Steimer's advice and just walk away. The, um, yeah, I think there's definitely you'll I feel like you kind of can feel it and, you know, like because. For, for this book, I'm talking about the Essex Serpent. It is, like, very highly – it's very critically acclaimed. Like, a lot of people really like this book. And I don't think it's a bad book, but I just found myself not super interested in the characters, not super interested in what was happening because it didn't feel like a lot was happening, and I wasn't sure when it was going to start happening. <laughs> Honestly, I probably – you might be right. Like maybe I quit it a little bit too soon, but at the same time, I went on to another book that I immediately enjoyed and had no issues with from start to finish. And that one, is, if you're curious, it's called, what the hell is it called? It's over here. Ele- Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine or something to that degree. And it was a fascinating book. If you like character stories, like you'll really like that book. Eleanor and Oliphant. Yeah, it is. Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Yeah. That's a <laughs> great book. Apparently they're making a movie. Or it was a movie. Oh, really? oh no. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> it's so sad that that's our knee-jerk well. reaction. I know. Some yeah. some b- movies based on books are good, like The Lord of the Rings. But Eddie most, Potter. Of, but most, of, yeah, Harry Potter movies also excellent. Yeah. Uh, but most of them are excellent. are pretty bad. Um, yeah, most of them are bad. Should we get into some questions? Yeah, questions. let's do it. All right, let's see here. How about? Mm. Oh, this is a semi-relevant one. Charles Hartford writes and says, Hey, ladies, over the weekend, the London Spitfire took the first ever grand finals for the Overwatch League, during which the coverage peaked somewhere around 300,000 concurrent viewers. I've always heard esports are important for gaming as a means of legitimizing it and growing its widespread appeal. Do you think that this is true? Or are they largely just going to be there for those of us who game anyways? Thanks for all you do and keep up the great work. Charles, this is a very important interesting and relevant question um i have really enjoyed watching people i know in the video games industry do really cool things in esports and seeing video games take major uh platforms on cable networks like what turner's e-league is doing what espn has done with something like heroes of the dorm and of course you know what blizzard is doing with overwatch league i think it's great that you know, you can go into a random bar on a weekend and see esports on TV. I think that's awesome. However, as somebody who worked very briefly in esports and got a very up close personal look, esports is still very much designed for people who play the game that is being played on television. Uh, John and I tuned in to Overwatch League for a little bit while it was on last weekend just to check out the production and see how the tournament was going and, you know, kind of, you know, just check it out. And. I had an incredibly difficult time following the play-by-play commentators. I have nothing but incredible respect for shoutcasters because that job is tough. It is an incredibly taxing position to be in, to know all of the players, to know all of the characters, to be able to do it super quickly and always keep your eye on what everyone is doing. Like I do not envy them, and I have a lot of praise for people who do that job. That being said, 
as somebody who has played Overwatch and who works in video games, I should have been able to follow what was going on. And I could not. And I wasn't really disappointed by that. I, I didn't know if it was me not having played enough Overwatch or if he was just speaking too fast or if his um, analogies that he was using or if maybe his accent was getting in the way. I don't know if it was a combination of all of these things, but I just did not enjoy watching it because I couldn't I couldn't keep up with what was happening. And I think of someone like me who has years of experience watching video games and watching competitive video games has trouble enjoying that. I can't even imagine what somebody who doesn't, who has never played the game before is thinking. So was it hard to follow what was happening on screen? Was it the terminology he was using? Like what weren't you understanding? I guess is what I'm trying to get clarification on. Sure. Yeah. So the on screen stuff is a little bit challenging to follow if you're not familiar with each of the characters, each of the heroes that people are playing as. And also like in any first person competitive esport, there's just like the jumping is just almost nauseating like the hops which I understand why they do it from a competitive play perspective but as a viewer I like it makes me a little queasy to constantly watch the player jumping up and down all the time to avoid fire like it's just I couldn't do it and then the a lot of criticism of Overwatch League by people who don't who aren't fans of Overwatch or who don't play Overwatch is that like there's just too much animation happening on the screen between all of the different super abilities and the colors and the different weapons that are firing it's a lot to kind of manage if you don't know what you're looking at and that's something that all esports suffer from I mean league suffers from that dota suffers from that I think the only game that really doesn't is counter-strike because the game is so old at this point that if like it, it, it almost looks like a generic military shooter Obviously, it's, you know, it's not. People who play Counter-Strike and people who are in video games know that. But if I was to show Counter-Strike Go to my dad, it would just look like a military shooter to him, right? Mm -hmm. And also, like, that game... I don't want to call the gameplay simple because that's not what I'm trying to say. But, like, it's more simple to follow, I suppose, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, And, like, if you think, like, of of regular traditional sports... Mm -hmm. Like very easy very hard ball. Yeah. It's like hard to do, like how hard to achieve that level of skill, which is why very few people do it, similar to esports. But at the at a base level, I can be like, if I don't understand all the rules of football, I still understand that them getting that ball to the other end means that they get points. <laughs> like at yeah. a base level, yeah. I know what I'm watching on to some degree. Yeah. The more points you win, I get it. I know how this works. I think that's kind of the struggle where a lot of games have is in order for it to be interesting to you as a player, it needs certain levels of complexity. However, that in turn means it's much more difficult for a wide audience to enjoy or appreciate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Agree. Maybe they should just start showing Madden. Call it good. <laughs> they have. <laughs> Actually, like the, the competitive Madden League has gotten a lot bigger in, in recent years, but... At that point, a lot of sports fans are saying, well, why wouldn't I just watch actual football? You know, and season. Right, but like how many times a year do people want want to watch competitive football? If you want to eat buffalo wings, then you've got an excuse to eat buffalo wings, and it is Madden (laughs) esports. Yeah, it's definitely interesting because the concept of esports in these games a lot more than you said, Simon, someone who, because my argument, not my argument, but Devil's Advocate was going to say, you know, but there's baseball on TV and there's football on TV and there has been for many, many, many years. And some people still don't understand it, but I think people accept it um, because they have been seeing it for so long. And do you think it's just a matter of it needing more airtime for people to get the grasp of it? And, you know, there are going to be people who will never understand it because some people still don't understand how baseball works. And to me, it can't get much simpler than that, but that's just my perspective. But Get you're the right. Ball. There are. The, there are... Touchdown. <laughs> Touchdown. <laughs> point. My point. Shit. Is not what I meant to say. Home <laughs> run is what I meant to say. Grand slam. Grand slam. Sports ball, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But, yeah. It's definitely a, a four. It's much more four and, and much more complicated. And I didn't think of it that way. So you enlightened me. And I thank you. I'm well, girl. I think that, you know, the thing about traditional sports, and this is a conversation I've had, you know, several times, is that traditional sports is something that we all grow up playing. You play basketball, baseball, tennis, maybe even football or flag football, like when you're in elementary school in gym class. 
right? Or maybe you participate in like a soccer team or a volleyball team or whatever kind of ball involved sport, you know, it, you know, when you're a kid and like, that's something that we as a culture, particularly here in the United States, but also worldwide, you know, we just do as a species, we play, we play sports games and that gives us all like a basic level understanding of how these major professional sports work. So while I don't know the intricacies of the rules and the penalties involved in a hockey match, I understand like what players have to do to get the puck into the goal, right? And I can get excited when one team, you know, makes an amazing shot on net and then and scores, right? It's it's easy to follow along with us, Dimer was saying. And that's the trouble that esports faces today. Now, what's really fascinating about it, though, is that there is so much investment happening in the world of esports that clearly there are millions of fans around the world that love watching it. There's no denying that. There's no denying the numbers of something like Dota 2's The International and the amount of concurrence that tune in for the league worlds every year, you know, or the amount of money that some of these players are making, even still today in something like competitive StarCraft 2. That being said... I still think this is a bubble. I really do. I think it's always going to be a niche. I think that the amount of money coming to, into esports is never going to get the return on investment. That esports will always be big and that they will always have an audience, but they're not going to ever overtake traditional sports. I firmly believe that. Yeah. I don't think that's unreasonable. No, <laughs> you would you would be surprised by how many people might w w have fought me on that, who th who think that esports are like the be all end all and that they're going to take over everything. And I'm like, they're not. They're too difficult to understand. Have you ever watched somebody play Dota two when you don't know what's happening? Even friends of mine that have played two thousand hours of Dota two don't know what's happening during the international. And I'm just like, <laughs> that's a problem. That means you can't take that sport mainstream it means you can't take it to abc you know or cbs or fox sports because people will click it on and be like oh there's a lot of colors and people cheering and then they'll be like i don't understand goodbye you know what's happening on hgtv <laughs> you know oh good shit on hgtv that's my jam just give me another yeah, fixer upper marathon i'm good to go but yeah, anyway, my Ooh, yeah. yeah, my point my point was like and, and Charles, I'm glad that you brought brought this up because I'm not trying to talk down to esports at all. I have a lot of respect for people who work in esports. I know a ton of players, I know I know managers and and commentators like I think it's awesome. I just don't think it's going to ever as he asks here legitimize and grow its widespread appeal. Wah wah. I don't know if it will never. I think it'll it's going to take something different than what is currently happening. I was so hoping Rocket saying, League could break through, but it's not doing it yet. He thinks esports are important for gaming as a means of legitimizing and growing it into widespread appeal. Yeah, I don't I think it could help. Maybe some people will be like, this is interesting. I don't think it, it'll hurt. I don't think it'll do any damage. That's fair. I think uh, you know, I think it's just I think esports will get more popular, but will it overtake traditional sports? No, there's too much in traditional sports that are so like woven into our daily society that we don't even, I think, realize that it's just like esports, man. It's not going to happen. They're awesome. They're fun to watch. I love the energy. Truth. I sat in a chair and watched Smash Evo for like five hours straight one time. So good. Anyway. I think fighting games have the best shot at it because fighting games are very, like, again, it's kind of got that, an element to it that you know, like, you know how a fight works when somebody wins like there's two people on one side of the screen like mm -hmm. okay like I'm punching you or kicking you or doing some special move like you can tell when someone's being damaged and then like you obviously know when someone's KO'd like you know like there are, there are clear things happening even if you don't understand how insane it is like the level that these people are and like the buttons and the combos like, you don't need to understand that in order to enjoy watching somebody play a fighting game yeah Evo is actually kicking off today in uh in sunny las vegas um las vegas i'm not sure i don't i would be curious to know if they ever released the ratings for how evo did when it was on espn i got to go and watch that at the mandalay bay um event center and i i mean watching like the street fighter championship is super exciting I agree with you, Steimer, that that like fighting games are maybe like the one genre that could be universally understood without having to know the rules of the game, not having to know like the specifics of the combos. But I still don't know yeah. 
like if it's gonna be enough i actually I'm, i just like very like firmly feel it won't be who knows maybe I'm i'll be saying, wrong it's it's got the best shot that's all i'm saying i agree i agree with you um all right uh one of you can pick a question from the uh from all the right. list there elmo shell active patron user thank you very much Thank you very much. I said thank you very – fuck it. I'm, I'm losing thank my mind. Thank you very much. What was the first album you ever owned? For me, it was the Batman Forever soundtrack. That's amazing. The first album? Like what sort of uh, – wow, I can't think of the name of what I'm trying to say here. What sort of medium are we talking about here? Because my first thing was like a cassette oh, tape. Yeah. And it sort was digital media. DLC, oh, yeah. crazy, sexy, cool. Ooh. And a boy that I had a crush on in fifth grade gave it to me, and it was the greatest day of my life. <laughs> That's awesome. You were like, oh, my God, are we married now? No, like, that was probably the only time in my life when I liked a boy and he liked me back at the same time. Oh. And I was in third grade, so I didn't do anything with it. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't make him sign a contract 20 years from now. Oh, 20 years from now. He's still very attractive. There you go. There's your I shot. just have not talked to him in a very long time. Take your shot. Uh, I remember my very <laughs> take, your, take your shot. shot. My very first hip-hop anything was a cassette called Mickey Unwrapped, and it was Unwrapped, U-N-W-R-A-P-P-E-D. Of course it and was. Of course it was. And he was standing there with like these sagging pants and like this cool hat on, these glasses. It was Mickey Mouse, obviously. Well, that and, like, well did that need to be explained? Well, you never know. I don't know. I don't want to confuse people <laughs> out there. And they took uh, very popular songs like Whoop, There It Is, uh, Whoop, There It Is, and they had Disney characters like rap in there with them. Um, what a Man, it was called What a Mouse, and they were singing about Mickey Mouse. And then there was like mini mouses in the house, like and oh god, they were so good. And I, I and that that and crisscross was those were my first two uh, cassettes. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I would listen on my boombox in my room, play with my Beanie Babies, and I had a good, I had a good time. I also did the thing a lot, especially with cassettes, where I would record songs off the radio. Hell yeah, like girl! I had own. so many yeah. mixtapes. Oh yeah! But I actually didn't own that many albums because I was just like recording shit. And then when the they radio. played your song, you had to run over parties. there, like oh, slam that. the record you get button. So mad when the DJ would talk over like the beginning of the song. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stab it! So see, kids, back in the day, for those of you who are like, "What the hell are these people talking? What are these old people talking about?" Oh, you could gosh. record songs on blank cassettes through your little boombox thingy, and you would play a radio station, and you would have a blank cassette in there, and then you would just hit the record button when your favorite songs came on, and then when you know you were done, you had an awesome mixtape of all your favorite songs, and that's I what made we did. So many mixtapes. Then we got LimeWire and all those other weird things. And now you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do anything. You've got Spotify. <gasps> now you got Google Play and Apple Music okay. and Pandora and every other streaming service under the sun. Yeah, I had. I think one of my first albums, like I remember my first CD specifically, but I, of course, had cassettes before then as well. I had uh, Janet Jackson's Janet on a uh, cassette. I believe I also had... Her album before that, I had like everything from Michael and Janet Jackson. I love the Jacksons. <laughs> so That's good. fair. Um, but my first album, my first CD, um, I remember was Joey Lawrence's Joey Lawrence album. Oh my so, god! So uh, Joey Lawrence. Also, how no. dare you? How dare you? Uh, Joey Lawrence was on one of my favorite sitcoms when I was a kid called Blossom. And he went on to do several other TV series throughout his career. Um, he also did a show with his and Joey. Yes, he also did a show with his his two brothers. Um, yes, what was that one called? Joey Lawson. No, Joey Lawrence. Oh, Lawrence. See, I already forgot. Um, right. Let me see, Joey. <laughs> okay, La I know who you're talking about. Brothers <laughs> show. Um, it was called Brotherly Love. I did, I did watch that show because, like, the middle brother was real hot. Yeah. I mean, they all were, they all were pretty They're all cute. pretty attractive, but like, I especially liked the middle one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm looking at whose name I have forgotten. Matthew or Andrew? Matthew. All right. Fair enough. He was the one I'm that like, was on, um, tool time. Wait, no, 
The actual no, name of that on, show, Home Improvement. He was on Boy Meets World <laughs> oh, as well, wasn't Home he? Improve- Tool Time. I love that you call it. Okay, I watched Home Improvement. Home Improvement. It was it was Boy Meets World. Wasn't oh. he, didn't he also do a stint on Home Improvement? Oh, maybe Joey he Lawrence? did, but I'm thinking of uh, not Joey. No, Matthew Lawrence. Yeah, the the middle one. Matthew Lawrence. Boy Meets World. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't. What, what did you? You thought he was on Home Improvement? I don't think he was on Home Improvement. Yeah, I'm not um, anything. Man, I thought he for sure familiar, he was. So I know his it's face, definitely but it's not... Boy Meets World that you're thinking oh, of. Okay, okay, okay. okay, okay. Home Improvement, and that was a good show right there. It was also was that Jonathan show. Taylor Jonathan Thomas, Thomas that I'm thinking of? Probably. Jonathan Taylor yeah. Thomas. Yeah, the, the heartthrob who was also... Oh my gosh, the singer. 90s heartthrobs, you guys. Ugh, taking me back. Okay. Those bowl cuts. So oh, man. good. Those frosted so tips. Now everyone's going to be thinking about their favorite 90s sitcom. Steimer, which of these questions would you like to answer? Um, if we want to keep it back in the past, back in the day, we can, we could go with Emma's, Emma's heartbreaking question. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, Emma Acorn asks, since the crew is about my age, I was wondering what children's movies scarred you for life. I'll say that, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to fuck up the pronunciation. I try you. you. I just want to make sure that was right. Yeah. Uh, losing his horse, uh, that in the swamp left me rattled. Curse never ending story. That's like, to this day. That scene is always super sad. It's fucking. It's heart wrenching. The day, like I just uh, get the horse. Get him out of there. Get him a rope. Get him a something. I don't Pull him out. That. Little boy with no upper arm strength. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember this one movie that I don't remember what age I was, but I think I was rather young. It was called Batteries Not Included. Oh yeah, classic. And I. Yeah, and I can't quite. I just remember being sad in that movie, like, or finding that movie incredibly sad, but I don't remember exactly why. Like, I don't remember the moment, but I remember just, like, the emotion. So I assume that they died at some point. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me look up the plot now. Battery's not included. <laughs> Brittany, do you have anything? Because you, you didn't really grow up watching movies. I watched a lot of Disney movies. Um, but did anything scar you? I'm sure. Yeah, there was something, but I can't remember what it was. Like, what did so? I know this because I've seen these movies as an adult, and then there's always that part that still like creeps you out as an adult. You're like, oh man, I, it's hard to watch, even though it's you know the fear is from your childhood. The <laughs> this is not a children's movie, so I don't know if this completely like screws up your question. But I decided to watch The Exorcist when I was oh in shit, elementary girl. school. See, I was gonna say it was Poltergeist for me. Oh yeah, that. That movie scared the crap out of me. I all I remember is the daughter like flopping around in bed, being possessed, like banging her head against the wall. And then after that, everything else was just like completely like blackout. I had a blanket over my head the whole time, and I just listened while my best friend, who's badass, watched the whole thing. She was my age, and she was like, "Oh, that was interesting." Wow, I don't know how she did it? She yeah. wasn't. She was a, a, a yeah, hardcore for sure. <gasps> Uh, for me, it was The Dark Crystal. Uh, that movie was That's, just yeah, so weird thing. because they had all these creepy as fuck animatronics, Ugh. right? Yeah, dude. I saw. So I went to the Jim Henson exhibit here at the Skirball Center because I went uh, with Lalana and I saw Labyrinth. Um, and it like they had some of the puppets. That, they had like obviously a lot of the Muppet Show Muppets, but then they had the Muppet. Dark Crystal puppets. They're so creepy. They're so creepy up close. Their skin, like whatever, like they have to make it look like skin, also looks like it's melting off of their face. So like it's just very unsettling getting that close to them. And I was like, God damn, I don't remember this movie, so maybe I never watched it. But I think I would have been terrified had I, oh. had I watched it. Cause like Willy that just. Willy Wonka, sorry, just cut you off. Willy Wonka scarred you? Will really? they want to, no, no. The the part that freaked me out was when they're on the chocolate river, which is like a gold. Oh yeah, that on the part. chocolate river, and they're going through. Yeah, and it shows all those crazy like flashes of imagery, and I couldn't even tell you really what they were because I never watched it, and I still actually I just watched this movie on a flight back from a kind of funny problem on the airplane, and I couldn't even watch it then. And it's like there's a he- a chicken being beheaded or something. I don't know, but it was like the flashing lights with the crazy music and Willy Wonka's disturbing ass face. And that part was really creepy. The creepiest thing I've ever seen in my life was from a movie from 1988 that I just Googled to find the right name of that is called Mac and Me. And if you want to see a creepy alien, you should Google this movie because it's 
freaky and they're all so ugly and just like very Mac unsettling. And Mac and me. M A C. Oh. Like, isn't that the creepiest thing you've ever seen? The spider baby from Toy Story. That the was Spider good. Baby. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that that's creepy and all, but have you seen Gremlins? I mean, come on. No. What? Brittany, you've never seen Gremlins? Are you serious? Hey. Of course she hasn't. No. Oh my Show gosh. Me. I know what we're doing next time. We're having a slumber party. So oh many gosh. Movies. Don't feed them after midnight. Mm. So good. That's a classic. Man, we could just keep going on and on. Emma, thank you so much for, for writing. It's always fun to take a little trip down memory lane. But we're going to have to wrap up the show for this week. Uh, again, if you guys want us to read your questions, we have a special tier for it now on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash what's good games. It's the Dear WGG. You can also go to what's good games.com slash Dear WGG and we'll take you right there. You can take all of the guesswork out of it. Uh, another thank you to Vincero for sponsoring this episode. And please, if you are in Austin or in the Texas area, come see us at RTX Austin. Again, we've got the meetup on Friday, the panel on Saturday, and the autograph and photo session on Sunday morning. And um, after that, we have a little bit of a break before we get ready for PAX West. Um, and we'll have lots of fun details to talk to you about what we're up to at PAX. But let me just say, if you guys joined us at PAX last year, it's going to be crazier this year. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be better. We're bolder. Uh -huh. We're newer. I don't, I don't know. The, I, okay. Now I'm just throwing adjectives out there. It's fine. Um, Andrea, yes. we have a fun podcast coming next week, don't we? <gasps> oh my gosh. I almost forgot. Brittany. Yes, we do. Do you want me to talk about it? Yeah. Um, so we actually, the reason why I almost forgot is because we like just finished wrapping up all of the details that we needed to nail down before we could officially announce it. So um, for the first time ever, we are going to be live streaming the entire show. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, you can watch the What's Good Games podcast live next Wednesday, August 6th. I believe we're starting at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash what's good games. You can also watch it at youtube.com slash what's good games. And it is brought to you by PayPal. And we're going to talk more about what we're doing with them next week. But mark it in your calendars if you want to watch the show live. Don't worry. It's still going to publish on Friday. If you're like, but I only listen to it on podcast form. Don't worry. We got you covered. The audio version will still go live as normal. The YouTube version will still go live as normal. But because of the special partnership that we're doing with them, uh, we are going to be live streaming the entire show. It's going to be pandemonium woohoo and that's wednesday august 8th just for clarification did i say august 6th yes that's not correct <laughs> but that's Oops. okay see that's why we got each other's back here what's good games august 6th is monday that would yeah. that would be bad that, we're not streaming really on not monday fun. that'd be very stressful we're gonna be recovering be from tired. rtx on monday <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thank you for reminding me about that. Of course, we'll have all of those details uh, on our Facebook page, on our Twitter page. You know where to find us. We love y'all. Um, so have a great weekend, everybody. Play some video games. Go outside. Enjoy some sunshine wherever you are. And we will see you next week. <laughs>